And, um, you know, even I will start a new um, theme on November 3rd, which is next Wednesday, for the book on the path to enlightenment. So it'll be a book study, but, you know, the book is um, a series of wonderful quotations and teachings that span the full arc of mind training in a slightly different framework than what we've been doing with the 59 mind training slogans of Atisha, or really Chikawa Yeshi Dorje wrote those for the most part. So uh, I think you'll find this interesting. It will continue to reinforce what we've been sharing up until now, but with some some new angles, some inspiring uh, words of wisdom from um, really, really the creme de la creme of the Tibetan tradition, the greatest teachers. Uh, unfortunately, there's only one woman quoted in there, I have to say. That's one complaint I have about the book. But there are a lot of really beautiful teachings in there that are worth, you know, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> and we can learn from them. And it's it's a book that I've read many times and have on audio as well. And I re I listen to it at night before I go to bed or on road trips. It's a great audio book. So On the Path to Enlightenment, edited by Matthew Ricard. Maybe somebody, uh, maybe Karen, could you type that into the chat for everybody so they can see it? On the Path to Enlightenment, edited by Matthew Ricard. So that starts next week. And even I, like we always do, sometimes we'll teach together. Sometimes we'll leapfrog, she'll teach or I'll teach. But um, it is it will be a continual uh, process through this wonderful book. And so tonight, I thought it would be suitable to kind of mark the juncture between the course that we just completed, the 59 slogans of, of mind training, and the upcoming course with some feeding your demons usually i try to do it once every you know six to eight weeks and we haven't done it for a while i haven't taught feeding your demons in a while so i'm excited to revisit uh an oldie but goodie and it feels like a good time to do some work around like karen said meeting our challenges uh befriending them rather than pushing them away wanting them to go somewhere else uh, we, we have this really wonderful structure together, a framework to turn towards and learn from them, heal, feed in the sense of healing, nourishing, and then uh, meeting the ally, the, the liberated energy of the knotted up feeling of obstacles or, um, you know, suffering that we, we all carry in us as human beings, you know, of course. But when that energy is understood or healed, transmuted and um essentially brought home to the heart you could say is another way of of meeting the challenges then that energy gets liberated and we can learn from it and it becomes uh, like an arrow in our quiver our allies so um i want to give a little introduction of what is feeding your demons how many people here are new if you can't see your video you could just if you can do a reaction and raise your hand how many people have never never done feeding your demons before uh-huh great okay a couple people good a few people yeah takes time to to react doesn't it find those buttons Great. Okay, good. So what I'll do is I'll spend a little time orienting us and then I'm going to guide you through it. So you, the bulk of the class tonight will be an experience. You'll get to close your eyes. I'll guide you through from step one to the final step five. And um, I think that you'll find, uh, find it uh, very interesting. It's a core practice in my life. It has been for a good uh, 15 years now. It's helped me in so many different situations in my life. And it's a technique that you can learn for yourself and do on your own. Also, when you learn it, you know, I would say read the book, you could share it with a friend or um, a loved one who asks you, of course, it's good not to put stuff on people, but there's definitely a guide in the book for how to do it with a buddy, how to do it with a friend. Having said that, if you feel drawn to this technique, and you want to share it, if you do want to share it professionally, we ask that you do the training so that you understand, you know, the, the pitfalls or how best to address certain issues if they arise to, to maintain a quality, just as a therapist would get certified, right? Even a yoga teacher or a massage therapist, you know, there are certain uh, techniques that need to be learned. 
And so I would just ask that everybody respect that. But to share amongst friends, you know, not getting paid for it, just to share, that's more, more than welcome. Okay, so uh, Feeding Your Demons is based on a, a, an old tantric Buddhist practice called chud, or ch sometimes it's called it means to sever or severance in Tibetan. I just found the Sanskrit word for it. It's called cheda sadhana. Cheda sadhana means the cutting practice. <laughs> and what it means is you're severing attachment to ego. You're severing attachment onto the sense of a separate self. You're not severing the self. You're not, you know, it's not violent. It's more of like dissolving. It's like I, I like to say, dissolving the fixation, dissolving the glue that keeps us fixated and grasping onto this illusory sense of self, which the Buddha taught is one of our core issues that we need to resolve in our life as human beings is to recognize that we grasp onto that which doesn't exist. And because of that, we suffer. So the sense of I, like me, it actually is like a mirage. When you try to find it in there, you can't really find it. it disappears. Depending on the angle you're looking, it will always be shifting. And yet we operate as if that eye is very solid and real. And so the practice of Dharma is to find out, you know, not this, not that, not this, not that, to get to the essence of who we are, which in the Buddhist languaging is just a language, is our Buddha nature, our essence, our core, our spirit, you know, our essential nature. Atman, if you want to go from the from the Hindu tantric perspective, is another word which is problematic for the Buddhist because the Buddha taught anatman, <laughs> not God, not I mean not self. Um, but I have tantric Hindu scholar friends, spiritual teacher teachers that I've talked with and dialogued with about this, and in the Hindu tantric tradition, they actually believe that the atman, the sense of self is the spark of the greater consciousness that we all have within us. So I thought, well, I can go with that. That sounds really good to me, you know? And so in any way, in any case, all traditions have different ways of speaking about our human condition. Why is it that we suffer? If we're essentially good, which is what the Buddha taught, that in essence, we are good. In essence, we are actually already enlightened then why do we suffer? I mean, it's an extremely valid question. It's like the first question we should all ask, actually. And what the Buddha said is we suffer because we, we take that which is not real to be real, which is the sense of self, reification of identity of self and other, and objects, appearances, everything. In the sense of, yeah, they're real, but they're not true. Remember um, Sokni Rinpoche's book, we did the study where he talked about real, but not true. Does anybody remember that? I think Karen was there, Jason, probably some others here on the call. So things can be real, you know, like my sense of Chandra, I'm, I'm here, I'm real, I'm not an apparition, but on a deeper level, level Chandra as a solidly separately existing thing separate self isn't really true and what the buddha said is that we're actually a confluence of different causes and conditions coming together namely the five skandhas of form like the five elements make up form right feeling like because we're in a body we have sensation we feel things uh, form feeling perception because of feeling we perceive and then because of all the prior three, we develop karmic volition. You know, when I feel hot, it's, I don't like it. So then I develop a karmic impression, uh, imprint of like not, you know, staying away from heat, you know, we're moving towards pleasure, moving away from pain. These are all karmic volitions. That's the fourth. And then the fifth skanda is consciousness. And when he talked about, when the Buddha taught this fifth one, consciousness, he wasn't talking about like, consciousness with a capital c necessarily the consciousness with a little c like because we have embodiment and we react with the world we have this brain and nervous system we we are aware we're conscious 
And, and then of course we have our Buddha nature, which is beneath that, which is more of like the capital C consciousness. So we're a confluence of these five rivers that come together to make one big river that then merges into the vast ocean, right, of consciousness. But when you peel apart and you look at this river, that river, this river, that river, you can't say, oh, form is self. Although our consumer modern materialistic culture does posit that for the most part. Uh, when you look just at feelings, you can't say, oh, well, there's the self, right? You can't really find a self within any of those, but when they come together, they create this beautiful, tragic ex experience of selfhood for as long as we're here in this body. Okay, so Chud gets at that. It helps us uncover and uh, find what we really are, Buddha nature, our na na nature of mind, um, our enlightened awareness, Rigpa, pristine awareness, whatever you want to call it, Prajnaparamita, Shunyata, these are all synonyms. These are all fingers pointing at the moon, which is the ultimate truth of who we are. So that is Dharma teaching. I just gave you a Dharma teaching, right? <laughs> Now, so th this practice of Chud was developed by an 11th century Tibetan yogini named Machi Glabrun. She was a badass, right? She went rogue. Not many women broke the mold, right? And she did. And so she, she took her studies of Prajnaparamita, the, the, the perfection of wisdom sutras, the fundamental Mahayana sutras, memorized, recited them, meditated on them as a nun, really did deep practice, and then also combined teachings that she received from her other lamas and masters who taught her about how to release attachment onto the body, home, family as your ultimate place of refuge. This is Dharma. You know, whether we as modern householders are going to go there, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to give up attachment to my kids, you know, and she had children. She, she never gave that up, but there's this teaching of the wandering ascetic, the wandering yogi, the wandering yogi, yogini who don't stay in one place for very long. You know, maybe if a night here, a few nights there, a couple nights there to uproot the attachment to comforts that keep us kind of in our you could say smelly nests, right? And so she left the monastery and began to wander with a, a band of yogins. Yogin is a new, neuter, neutral term for male, female, non-binary, I'm sure. <laughs> everybody in between and around. So yogin, I'll, I can use that word and everybody's included. So she had these experiences and she developed the chud based on this in terms of going to scary places, Go to places that you normally wouldn't want to go and test out the level of your meditative absorption, your concentration, your, your fearlessness, you know, because if you're meditating on a mountain pass in the middle of the night or a dark forest and you hear something, you know, the body, oh, the fear, the protection, it, it, it's a beautiful teacher there. So then you get to observe it. Oh, did my mind create that? Is there really a, an animal out there? Or was that just the wind in the trees? So then you, the practice is working with it. So Chud is well known for its liturgical, beautiful melodies. It's played with a double-sided drum and a bell. And the melodies are chanted and sung. So it's a healing ritual, actually. It's amazing. And so my teacher, Lama Tsultram Alioni, learned that traditional Tibetan tantric practice, Buddhist practice, and did it for many years and even taught it for quite a while when she realized, you know, this is transformative for, you know, a lot of people. But because we're Westerners, we don't speak the language, we're chanting in a foreign language. It's kind of, um, you know, different. It's very different than the way we have grown up understanding spiritual practice. So she was noticing that not everybody was really getting it, you know? And so she began to um, 
talk with people, therapists, friends. She went back to school and developed, got her master's degree and developed the, uh, a combination of the chud with modern gestalt therapy. So empty chair dialogue, therapeutic techniques where you dialogue with fragmented aspects of yourselves. This also has um, similarities to internal family systems. I have friends who are both certified in feeding demons and internal family systems or Jungian psychology, Gestalt, very conducive. And so she adapted Chud, the crux of Chud, the core teach, the core practice of Chud with the, with the um, Gestalt. So this is a hybrid for our modern times. She says, Lamed Sultram says, this is chud in Western clothing. And so um, afterwards you can journal about it. So I'll try to give you some time to, if you want to right now while I'm talking to get your journal out, get a pen and paper or something. So you have that near you uh, because some beautiful insights can come during the practice and you'll have your eyes closed the whole time. Sometimes people open their eyes to jot things down if something really poignant comes to you. But for the most part, your eyes are closed throughout the whole process. So afterwards, I give you time to journal. Um, the point is, is that we, we go to the places that scare us. That's a title of one of Pema Chodron's books, too. It's a very core Buddhist principle, even beyond Chud, very much a Lojong teaching. Uh, it's, it's kind of like, you know you're getting more advanced as you develop your capacity to turn towards that which you would normally turn away from. And the, the feeding, it's called feeding your demons because we feed rather than fight our so-called demons. So we, you will go through a visualization where you will imagine feeding the so-called demon nectar till it's completely satisfied. And then I'll ask you, now notice what you see. And usually this demon energy has transformed into something else. Maybe it's dissolved altogether. Maybe it's transformed into another looking entity or energy. And then I'll have you dialogue with that. It's usually the ally. You know, so if it's dissolved, I'll say, now just imagine that your ally appears. So. Um, a couple points here. I want to say about the five steps before we actually close our eyes and do it. Um, there'll be two different moments where I will invite you to repeat after me out loud. It's very good to do it out loud. You can do it internally, but there's something about speaking out loud that helps the process deepen. So when you, when I, there'll be a point in the, I think it's the step two where you'll personify the, the energy within you that you're working with. And I'll have you ask it some questions. And so you'll repeat those out loud. What do you want? What do you need? And how will you feel when you get what you really need? You don't wait for the answer to come from outside. I will tell you right after asking those questions, right one after another, like rapid fire, you'll switch positions and you'll take the, an empty seat in front of you. So you'll want an empty pillow or empty chair. Or if you're on a couch, you can start on one side of the couch and then switch to the other. And you get to embody what it feels like to be that demon, be that energy. And then you speak it. I'll guide you through answering those questions as the demon. It's a lot different than just imagining what the demon would say from your vantage point, from your normal vantage point. And the same with the, uh, with the ally. You'll get to ask the ally some questions, then you'll switch positions and become the ally and answer as the ally. Very powerful. That's the gestalt right there. Okay, so you might wonder, like, what am I going to work with? Well, the answer is work with whatever you feel is blocking you and blocking your experience of freedom. That's what Machi Glavdrin, the founder of Chut, said to a student when they asked, asked her, what are demons? She said, they're not goblins or ghouls or real entities out there, ghosts. They are that which 
lives within you in the sense of emotions or thought patterns that block your experience of freedom. So I'm sure we could name a few. <laughs> Self-loathing, insecurity, fear. So I'm talking about like emotional patterns there, but it can also be addiction. We did a whole pilot study on feeding your demons for people who had a history of addiction, anxiety, and depression. And there was really good outcomes, better than mindfulness. So those papers are being written right now. And uh, there's a qualitative and a quantitative paper that will be published on our study. So you can work with like, and it doesn't have to be substance addiction, like cigarettes or alcohol. It could be sex addiction. It could be um, addiction to your phone. I mean, how many people are addicted to their phone? And sometimes it feels really toxic. Sometimes I just want to throw my phone, get away from me. <laughs> um, also, you can work with illness, like chronic pain. In Lama Tsultram's book, uh, Feeding Your Demons, which is a great book, I highly recommend it. She tells many stories of students, people she's worked with over the years who one person had AIDS, so they worked with their with AIDS demon and actually had a, a drastic turnaround in terms of their white blood cell count. So I'm not promising like miraculous healing, but that did happen. But also it can help us work with our, our emotional reactions to our, our physical pain or illness. So you don't necessarily have to know what the demon is. You just have to feel in your body what's blocking me right now. What's blocking me? Anger? Jealousy? Competitiveness? Stubbornness? sadness, depression, all of that, any of that works, any of this can be brought to the feeding your demons practice. So what I'm going to do is we'll start in a moment and I'll guide you through some relaxation breaths to help you drop in. And then I'll give you a few minutes to really think about feel into what you want to work with. And then we'll take our first step. Okay. So the process takes about 35 minutes, usually is how long it takes in a group. So that's about the length of time we usually sit. So really take this as a meditation practice. Yes, it's a personal process. It's not like classically a meditation practice until you get to the fifth step, which is resting in awareness. That is the classic. That's where the classic Buddhist meditation comes in. That's what makes feeding your demons different than Gestalt therapy, along with some other elements, because most of those therapeutic techniques don't have the meditation at the end. And what's so brilliant about putting it there, I'm sure you can guess, you, you've arrived, you know, you've, you've, what I like to say is you've done your internal housekeeping, <laughs> you know, you've tidied up, you've nourished yourself. So that when you slide into home base of the fifth step, there's no doing that needs to happen. There's no meditating that needs to be done. You're just there. And it's just releasing any distraction, just staying in that space. So see for yourself how that feels. Okay, so any questions before we dive in? Maybe I'll take a couple, but chat or a a verbal one, just try to, you know, be concise so we can, we can um, address it and then go. Really, any questions about like, I'm confused about a demon or something, not feel necessarily philosophical, but something applied to the, the practice. You might even have more, you, you might, sometimes it's nice to just do it, you know, and then Sometimes the mind gets a little like, and it wants to delay the practice and ask a ton of questions. <laughs> 
It's good to just do it. Okay, I'm not seeing, I'm kind of chit chatting to give you time to think. Do you have a question? No. Okay. All right. So settle in and find a comfortable seat and then make sure you have an empty space in front of you with a chair, an empty chair or an empty cushion. Then your journal and your pen or pencil or your piece of paper is off to the side so you don't sit on it when you switch positions. Tell your cats and your kids and your partners or your phone that not to bug you for 35 minutes, okay? Turn off your notifications and I will do that too. And really claim this space for yourself. Because you know what? If we don't claim this space, nobody else is really going to claim it for us. So claim it if you can. Because you'll go deeper. It's like a shamatha practice. You really want to have a good conditions conducive to an internal space opening up. And trust yourself. And if trusting yourself is a demon, then take that as your demon tonight. <laughs> if self-doubt or the critic is your demon, take that as, as your work tonight. The key is to really feel into, okay, I might have a bunch of these different blockages, but what's really up for me tonight? What's been, what have I been carrying with me today, this week? You know, as Halloween approaches, what's been haunting you? <laughs> okay. So you can have your body perpendicular to the computer even. So, you know, I can see your profiles. If you don't mind some people having their videos on, that's nice because it helps me gauge the group. Not everybody has to do that. So your profile, and then when you switch positions, you'll just switch and then your other profile will be showing on my screen. And if you want to turn off your screen, you're more than welcome to, of course, always. So let's drop in and close your eyes or have them slightly hooded if you feel more comfortable that way and keep them closed as much as possible throughout the whole process and we begin by taking what's called nine relaxation breaths so the first three breaths breathe into any physical tension you're holding in your body so take some deep conscientious breaths belly breath Release any tension on the out breath, working with physical tension for the next few breaths. Inhale into it and release with the out breath. Feel it melting down, down into the earth beneath you. And with your next few breaths, breathe into any emotional tension you're holding. Notice where you're holding emotional tension in your body. And then releasing that tension with the out breath, feel it melting down into the earth beneath you. And for the last few breaths, breathe into any mental tension or worries you're holding. And notice where you're holding mental tension in your body. Then hooking that tension with the breath, releasing it with the out breath, melting down into the earth beneath you. Now let's take a moment to generate a heartfelt motivation to practice for the benefit of yourself and all beings. Recognizing that your personal work has a ripple effect around you and beyond.
Good. And so now we'll take a few minutes to really deeply contemplate what is it that I'd like to work with tonight? Maybe you already know. If not, then take some time to really excavate what's here for me. It doesn't have to be a big dramatic thing. It might be kind of like a sleeper. Just a little nagging feeling that you've been carrying with you or a reaction to someone that triggered you. Sit in silence for a couple minutes. And when you've landed on so-called demon or challenge that you'd like to work with in this session, you know, if you have a few options, just in the next few moments, really clarify and just land on one. Don't try to feed a few. That'll be confusing. And just really crystallize the one for tonight. can even be helpful to remember a particular time or incident when it came up really strongly, this challenge, this demon. And scan your body and locate where you are holding this demon most strongly in your body. It's a very somatic, visceral practice, less cerebral here. So drop into the body and feel where this feeling lives most strongly in your body. And then notice the shape of the feeling in your body. And what is its color? And what is the texture of this feeling in your body? Is it spiky or fuzzy or soft, smooth, sharp? What is the texture of a feeling?
And what is the temperature of the feeling? Is it hot or ice cold or lukewarm? And now for a moment, intensify this feeling. Bring it to the forefront. And now allow this feeling, this texture, this temperature, sensation to move out of your body and become personified in front of you as a being with limbs, the face, eyes, and so on. You can even, if you wish, take your hands and make a gesture of moving the energy out of the body for the time being and letting it manifest in front of you as a personified being. Notice what you see. And notice the following about this so-called demon, this being in front of you. What is its size? Its color. the surface of its body. What is its density? Is it a dense being or is it a light being? Dense or... ethereal and notice if it has a gender What is its character? Its emotional state. What is the look in its eyes? And notice something about the demon you didn't see before.
And now you're going to ask the demon three questions, one after the other, out loud. And then you'll switch positions and become the demon. What do you want? What do you really need? How will you feel when you get what you really need? Having asked the questions now, slowly switch positions and take the empty seat in front of you. If, or if you need to, you can just stand up and turn towards your original seat. It's important to move, to do this move. Keeping the eyes closed as much as possible, stay in your experience. And take a moment now to settle into the demon's body and feel what it's like to be the demon. Feel free to take a gesture, a stance, a position that helps you embody the demon. Notice how it feels to be in the demon's body. Notice how your normal self looks from the demon's point of view. Now answer the question, speaking as the demon. Really make sure you are speaking as the demon. What I want is, what I want is, What I really need is, this is the need beneath the want, going deeper. What I really need is. And when I get what I really need, I will feel. When I get what I really need, I will feel. So landing on a feeling tone, a feeling you'll have. And take note of this answer, what the feeling you would have when you got what you really needed. Taking note of that feeling, and when you're ready, return to your original seat. And take a moment to settle back into your body. Eyes are closed. See, sense, feel the demon in front of you again. And 
And so now imagine that either you dissolve your body into nectar or you create an infinite supply of nectar in any way that feels intuitive to you. And this nectar has the quality of the feeling that the demon would have when it gets what it really needs, the answer to that third question. So if it was love, then the nectar would be like nectar of love. And offer the demon this nectar from you to it, flowing, appearing in any way that feels intuitive. It might be raining down. It might be a ray of light from your heart. It could be mother's milk. It could be soup that you feed it to just let the intuition guide you here. Feed the demon this nectar until complete satisfaction is reached. Notice the color of the nectar. And notice how the demon takes the nectar in. Does it drink it? Does it eat it? Does it swim in it? Does it absorb it through the skin? Feeding the demon to complete satisfaction, this unending supply of nectar flowing from you to the demon. And so after feeding the demon to complete satisfaction, notice what's there. Is there a being present after the demon is completely satisfied? If there is a being present in place of the demon, ask this being if it is your ally. If there's no being present, then invite an ally to appear. And if the being says, no, I'm not your ally, also take a moment here to invite an ally to appear before you now in the space, in your mind's eye. And when you see the ally, Notice the details of the ally as much as you can. What is its size? And 
its color. The surface of its body. its density, does it have a gender? What is the ally's character? its emotional state, and the look in its eyes. Notice something about the ally you didn't see before. Really feeling connected with the energy of the ally. And now you're going to ask it some questions, repeating out me just like after me, just like you did before. How will you help me? How will you protect me? What pledge do you make to me? And how can I access you? And once you've asked those questions, change places and become the ally. And take a moment to settle into the ally's body. Feel free to take a gesture, a position, an expression that helps you embody the energy of the ally. And notice how it feels to be in the ally's body. And notice how your normal self looks from the ally's point of view. And when you're ready, you'll go ahead and answer the question speaking as the ally. I will help you by, I will help you by.
I will protect you by. I will protect you by. I pledge I will, I pledge I will. And you can access me by, you can access me by. And uh, if there's anything else you'd like to say as the ally, go ahead and say it now. Any guidance? And then when you're ready, go ahead and switch back to your original seat for the last time. Settling back into your own body and see the ally opposite you. See the ally in front of you and look into its eyes and feel its energy pouring into your body, its protection, its care, its wisdom. And as you feel the energy of the ally coming into your body, it spreads all the way down to the soles of your feet, to your fingertips and throughout your whole body. Now imagine that the ally dissolves into light and notice the color of this light and feel this light dissolving into you, integrating this luminosity into every cell of your body. Notice the feeling of the integrated energy of the ally in your body. And now you, along with the integrated energy of the ally, dissolve like a rainbow dissolving in the sky, back into the space from which it came. Feel your awareness vast like space. 
and rest in that state that's present after the dissolution, just rest. And now slowly beginning to come back, come back into this room, come back into the body, feel your breath in your belly, the clothes on your skin. And as you gradually come back into your body, also recall the feeling of the energy of the ally within you. And then slowly begin to open your eyes and take some time to journal. About eight, 10 minutes to journal. And as much as you can remember poignant parts, you can 
you know, jot down the, what it is you worked with and what the demon looked like and what the answers to the questions were. Likewise with the ally, what did it look like? What were its messages? And then how did it feel to dissolve and rest? The fifth step. Take about eight minutes to journal.
about another minute. And then we'll come back for questions or comments. Okay, so let's go ahead and come back. We've got about 10 minutes for discussion, sharing, questions. And when you share, it can be nice to hear, you know, it's, it's fun to hear people want to share. You actually don't always have to share at all, but you don't have to even share what demon you're working with if you're feeling that you don't want to talk about the actual demon, but you could talk about the imagery that came, you know, the demon looked like a fuzzy little wicked teddy bear and, <laughs> you know, the ally was an angel or whatever. It's fun to hear about the imagery and what that means to you and the messages that the allies gave us or demons gave us. And how did it feel to embody the first the demon and then embody and speak as the ally too? Um, but really, you're welcome to share what you want. You could chat or you could unmute Sue and then Jason. You can then, do, yeah, if you want to raise your hand, you could do that. Geneva, Geneva can go third. Um, so that was very beautiful. And I really thank you for that. And I was wondering if um, you might have a recording of that somewhere. Of leading yeah. people through this yeah and this will be posted within a day or two also so if you want to revisit this particular one you can do that on the youtube channel for sf dharma collective and you could Marvelous. just play it yeah and then but you can also find online i have i have quite a few past feeding your demons so if you just type into youtube feeding your demons chandra easton You'll find other ones too, other teachings and guided. You'll probably also find Lama Tsultrim guiding it, which would be fun, and some other teachers as well. So my other question was, um, do you see this as a way of achieving purification in the same way that one might do japa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Even Lama Tsultrim says this is a form of Nundro, you know. She developed a lineage path called the Magyu, the mother lineage, based on Machig's teachings, and it includes this. And it, it, she says this is a certain form of Nundro, which is preliminaries that are all in Tibetan Vajrayana or Tantric Buddhist practice, like Japa, like mantra recitation, which is Japa for those people who don't know what that is. Japa sounds like fun, doesn't it? I'm sure people were like, what is Japa? <laughs> Let's do it. Sounds like Java. Let's drink it. Um, but yeah, it's a form of purification. Absolutely. And integration. And maybe even, I don't want to say more, but maybe equal or even perhaps more powerful for us modern people at times where our emotional body needs some tending. <laughs> That's, a good That's great because I've been um, trying to approach feeding, feeding your demon work um, for the past two weeks. And then I just heard that you were going to, I saw that you're going to be here and it's just, I'm, I'm really grateful. Thank you. Mm. I'm glad you came. It was wonderful. Just wonderful. Thank good. you. Good. Thank you for sharing that, Sue. That's the first time I've gotten that question. That's a very good question in terms of purification. Yeah, I mean, because I've been feeling like I need to go back to purification practices, just basic purification practices, mm -hmm. which I've had a really hard time with because I have very intense interactions. Mm -hmm. Like I've roared for years and then I started chanting and dancing and just all this 
things. And, you know, when I was doing the demon, I was growling in the way that I've Good. heard myself do during Japa, actually. Mm -hmm. So that was really interesting. Yeah. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. For those people who don't know exactly what we're talking about in, in many traditions, obviously, there's purification practices. Specifically, I can speak from the Buddhist perspective of, you know, the reason why we forget who we are, why we suffer, why we cling to a separate sense of self is because we have these karmic veils that obscure that perception, that knowing, that luminosity, the cloud our luminosity. And so purificatory practices, whether it's mantra recitation, prostrations, making offerings of the mandala or uh, bodhicitta prayer. There's all sorts of ways in the nundro in the preliminary practices of Vajrayana Buddhism that uh, we purify our perception so that we can, it's kind of like earning, earning our way there a bit, you know, which works with, with our kind of, it kind of works. It definitely works. Um, although ultimately this is nothing to be earned, you know, but the, the thinking mind, sometimes it, it needs to to purify but also sometimes our karmic patterns are pretty dense you know and if that's just the way it is you know it's lifetimes lifetimes and so these these are ancient technologies that help us purify the veil so that we can have greater access and um, beating your demons is definitely a way of doing that of resolving and reintegrating remembering who we are through feeding the demon and then meeting the ally who's none other than you the demon's none other than you and the ally's none other than you and really like for me it dawned on me after doing many of these and is that i am my ally i am you know coming home to realizing that i am my greatest ally <laughs> like the true i it was interesting that when the demon no when the ally looked at me and you asked what you know what does the ally see it there was just pure spaciousness mm. yeah that's nice compared to the demon do you remember what the demon saw what the demon saw yeah just kind of like a needy thing right isn't that <laughs> interesting <laughs> yeah good i'm glad it sounds like the process really was deep for you yeah, Denise says, very powerful. Thank you. Surprising and freeing. Great. Right. Okay, so Jason's next. Right, was Jason next? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a quick comment about this particular one, and I really do appreciate it, Chandra. It's always, always surprising what comes up. And in this one, I just wanted to share, I had this very striking image of, um, I was working with self-agitated um, agitated self-centeredness and how I become defensive, you know, there's like, there's some yeah. kind of like thing that happens. And it turns out that like the, the demon was this warrior soldier defender. Yeah. And when I became the defender, I kind of looked at myself and I went like at your service, literally, like I actually did that sort of like, I'm your, I'm your soldier. <laughs> and I just cracked up. I thought that was really funny, but that's it was almost so like, funny. I felt like, yeah, that there's this part of me that is like, the, the, the thing I wrote about was like, this soldier is willing to die for me. And I'm like, you don't need to, you know, you can chill out. <laughs> so we had this dialogue, it was great. But um, I just found that really, it's always entertaining and, and illuminating yeah. to see that side of ourselves. What was your ally then? My ally was um, a complete, like the furrowed brow and this kind of, I was very uh, compressed in that state. And the ally was this mature, stable, generous. Um, that, that that you know the, the demon was young and 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 sort of really defensive, and the ally was this mature, wise, very settled adult. And it was actually me. Both of them were me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I was seeing like, wow, that's my role model. Yeah. I made my own role model out of that. My ally is sort of this mature, stable person. Mm. It doesn't need defending. It's such liberation in that sharing, Jason. It's just so beautiful. 
yeah, like you don't have to do that. Don't have to die, die for it. And what a, what a great message. And you felt it, you know, you know that now. It's not just an idea. It's really in you. That's great. Thank you. Laura. Uh, I have a question because like I noticed um, <laughs> my parents appeared in demon and ally form. <laughs> Uh -huh. And I was like, huh, because I did this one other time and it, that's not what happened the last time I did it. I mean, they were not. And I was like, wow, what was that about? Although one of the, like my mother sort of fluctuated between herself and this other kind of very, this sort of Indian looking figure in a beautiful sari and they kind of fluctuated. And my fa more father-like figure was like a <laughs> black tar kind of thick and heavy, but there was definitely some presence of them in it. And I, I you know, last time I did this was very different. I, and I'm not quite sure, like, is that, mm. you know, can your ally be somebody who, you know, was real? Yeah. Life and they can, they can be. Yeah. And, and if, if the process is flowing and it's, and it's working, it's fine. There's no problem with that. You know, if you're derailing because you're fusing or you're kind of like too enmeshed in what they, who they actually are. I don't know if this is true for you, Laura, but when that's happened to me, usually there's something a little unhuman about them, like a little animal, like maybe there's some fangs or like, like you said, like tar, they, they've got like a, there, there can be something that makes them just a little bit, not cartoony, but a little bit, not just a human. Sometimes it is just a human. Sometimes ch a child will appear, you know, it could be your child. Like what I meant to say is like your inner child or your, who you were as a child sometimes appears as someone's ally, as their ally, or it couldn't be people in your life. That's okay. My, both my parents are gone. So, mm. you know, in a way it was really, it, it was this other version of them. Yeah. It feels very much, you know, I guess I've just been thinking about the way they live on in you. And that's been on my mind lately. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. That was really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. It's beautiful to have them, have them with you in some way. Yeah. Was there anyone else? I think we're at 902, so I guess I I should actually chop chop. Cheda sadhana. Not this, not that, not this, not that. <laughs> okay, good. So we will see you next week. Same place, same time. Thank you for coming and bringing your courageous heart to your own healing. I hope you found it beneficial. Yeah. Thank you. Good to see your notes in here. Thank you. Thank you. You can unmute and say goodbye if you want. And then we'll close it down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.